great. Thank you for being here. I, I can't tell you how exciting this is for us. I mean, uh, we as an institution um, are famous for deliberation, but when our strategy group came and, and brought us this idea that we could do a reverse pitch, there was no deliberation. We said, this is something we really want to do. This is exciting. Um, it is moving us into uh, the areas of technology that we want to be in. As you're all aware, we're on the east side, which is clearly is a rather famous technological hub, and we need to meet the demands of our patients and our providers um, in that process. So let me move forward. Um, I'll try here. I will attempt to move us forward. All right. Technologically savvy <laughs> physician. Uh, Ah, it's not me. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, we'll do a little overview of overlay, overlay here. Let me get out of the way. Um, we're uh, a community hospital, and, and we're very proud of that fact. Our, our mission is to serve our community. We're not for profit. We actually don't take levy money either. So some of our neighbors um, do collect property tax and help support themselves, but we don't do that. So the concept began in 52. I'm going to do this fast. In 1960, the hospital opened, small hospital on the east side. Um, we have progressed rapidly in 2007. We opened up our five-story south tower. Um, great, thank you. And um, we also have a very um, uh, a wonderful heart and vascular center that we are very proud of and we feel offers some of the most cutting edge therapies. Uh, we also have a neuroscience institute that opened up uh, just last year. We have a total of 349 beds. That puts us in kind of the medium-sized hospital range. Um, we directly employ over 120 providers. And right now on the east side, there's about a million residents. So we have a very large service area. The last thing I'll say, which is on here, is we actually have over 1,000 providers. So over 1,000 uh, physicians, actually about 1,200 providers when you throw in the <coughs> mid-levels. So we have a very sizable um, population that we serve as well as um, uh, providers. What do we do? Um, I'm not going to read all these numbers. Um, they're, they're, we're very proud of it. We work very hard to uh, stay busy and provide absolutely the, the highest quality and safest care. Um, I'll let you look at those and we'll move on here. Um, a couple things I'd like to point out. You can't do healthcare these days unless you're focused on quality and safety. And that, that is mission number one. Uh, we um, are very proud of our LeapFrog uh, rating. Uh, an A rating is something that's very hard to get. Uh, they do a survey twice a year. We have over three years now, we actually have seven surveys, I believe, um, where we've gotten that A rating. That's one of only eight hospitals in the state and the only one on the east side. You know, there's a lot of other rating agencies. There's health grades and US News, and we, we do very well with all of those. Um, Joint Commission is an accreditation agency um, we're only one of about 700 hospitals in the nation that are listed as a top performer. Other things, we're a level three trauma center. We're actually Harborview's backup should Harborview collapse or the big, the big one strike. Um, we're the backup for them on the east side. We have a level three NICU. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, very advanced cardiac program, which includes cardiac surgery, structural heart, uh, electrophysiology, which is advanced diagnosis of electrical conditions of the heart and treatment. We do a lot of arrhythmia work. Um, we have an advanced neurosciences program. It covers all areas. Uh, one thing we do, which many don't, is uh, called endovascular neurosurgery. So it's actually putting catheters in the brain to uh, take care of stroke and other conditions. And then last, um, we have a wide variety of uh, subspecialty medical and surgical programs. And, and we feel that we need this to be the community hospital for the east side. This is, this is part of our mission. The clinics are, are an essential part of uh, what a system is. Um, in 2015, our primary care and urgent care centers took care of over 190,000 visits. If you think that's a lot, it is. Um, we served over 45 unique, 45,000 patients in our three urgent care uh, locations. We're opening up a fourth urgent care uh, location uh, right now up in the Lake Hills neighborhood. Um, the urgent care clinics are open some six, some seven days a week with extended and after hours. You can see there's a good wide uh, geographic uh, dispersion throughout the east side to make sure that we're covering all of our patient needs. 
So uh, I'm gonna hand off here in just a second. We're gonna do our two statements. The first will be uh, presented by Dennis Rochier, who's our physician and CEO of our clinic system, and then you'll get me again for problem statement number two. So I'm gonna pass off to Dennis. So my name's Dennis Rochier. As you heard, I'm a primary care physician. I see a lot of Overlake people here in the audience tonight, and I'm very disappointed about that. I was hoping to have a room full of total strangers <laughs> that I would never have to face again. So my background is primary care, uh, and I love the U.S. healthcare system. I've worked in it for three decades, and I love it because it's a system that's designed entirely around me, the doctor. <laughs> so if you're sick and you need me, I'm there for you, as long as you need me, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, between 9 a.m. and 11.30 a.m., <laughs> or between the hours of 1 and 3.30, unless it's a major holiday, minor holiday, observance, Bastille Day, or one of my children's birthdays, in which case I will close. It wasn't always that way, however. When I was growing up in a small town in Texas, if I was sick and my parents wanted to take me to a doctor, they would take me to this small clinic that was staffed by a couple of family medicine docs. That clinic was open all the time. They were hardworking doctors. My parents would take me right in, and we would wait. And we would wait until we could be seen. Didn't matter what day of the week it was, there was no day that we didn't have to wait. There was no time that we could go in that we didn't have to wait. So as healthcare has progressed, we've developed a new innovative approach to healthcare delivery. It's called urgent care. Urgent care is a clinic that's open for long hours. It's staffed by usually a couple of family medicine doctors and you can go in anytime you want and you can wait. <laughs> so things seem to be coming back around again and I don't know why we can't use our technology to fix this problem to do away with the weights to match up the demand of our patients with our capacity to provide the care to those patients. All we've done with our technology is create fancy schedules using spreadsheets and with a single, a few keystrokes, I can wipe out entire hours of my availability. <laughs> so here's the problem statement spelled out for you. What tools and technologies can Overlake use to improve patient access to care? Let me, uh, let me spell this out by telling a story. It's a story I call A Tale of Two Saturdays. So on the first Saturday, you get up, you're gonna to go to a big wedding that night. It's a, not your wedding, it's not that big, but it's a wedding of a close friend. There's gonna be a couple of hundred people there. You look in the mirror and you realize that you really need to get a haircut before you go to this wedding. You know that you need a haircut because you're looking at a straight frontal view and you can see your neck hair. So you reach into your pocket and you whip out your smartphone and you open up your Spiffy Cuts app and you click on it and you see that there are no less than four Spiffy Cuts within a 15 minute drive of your present location. Each of those Spiffy Cuts displays on your screen how many minutes the current wait time is. You see one that only has a 15 minute wait, you calculate your drive time, you punch on that, you're in line. You drive over, you walk in, you get your hair cut, you go about your day, right? Now, let's take another Saturday. You wake up, you're gonna to go to a big wedding that night. It's an important wedding, it's not your wedding, but a lot of people will be there. You look in the mirror, and you see these strange spots, blotchy marks on your face, and you start feeling a little feverish and a little scratchiness in your throat. You wanna to go to the wedding, but you don't wanna be the index case for the next worldwide pandemic of avian flu. So you think, maybe I should get checked out at my nearby Overlake Urgent Care. Overlake is on my health plan, they're in my network, I like them, they have good doctors. So, can you call and get an appointment? No, you can't, because Urgent Care, although they're open long hours and they're convenient, they don't take appointments. Can you get in line electronically? No, you can't, because they don't have an app. So you drive to the closest one, you walk in, and the room is full of people with similar rashes and you start worrying, this is really gonna be bad, there's something going on here, they tell you it's a two hour wait. You say, oh God, I can't wait two hours, I have things to do, I got this big wedding to go to, I feel okay, I just don't wanna start an epidemic, can't somebody see me? Well, maybe you are so persistent you cajole the front office person to actually get on the phone and call to the nearest other urgent care center and you're told good news. There's only one person in the waiting room over there. So you get in your car, you drive across town to the urge, other urgent care, and just as you're pulling into the parking lot, a school bus pulls in 
with 13 junior high school soccer team girls and in their right hand they have their sports physical form and in their left hand they have 35 grubby $1 bills. It's now a two and a half hour wait. Do you see where I'm going with this? The problem is that our clinics can't tell you when there's availability. They can't even tell each other because by the time you get in your car and go from A to B, the situation has changed and there's no way in real time for them to know. I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? You can do this with your hair, but you can't do this with your body. So I want you to understand that this is something we would like to apply primarily in our urgent care settings, but maybe it could be scaled. Maybe we could use it in our primary care clinics. Maybe if you knew you could go into a primary care doctor anytime you wanted and be seen in a reasonable amount of time, you wouldn't make that appointment three months in advance only to be called one week before your appointment and find out that your doctor has decided to go on a vacation and now you have to reschedule. You wouldn't have to schedule any appointments. You would just go in. I mean, look, you don't make an appointment to go to the grocery store to buy a can of beans. You decide you need some beans, you get in your car, you go to the store, you go to the bean aisle, there they are, right? Now I realize that healthcare is not a can of beans, but doesn't it seem there should be some way for you to know when you can get what you need without having to go through this, all this rigmarole? I'm sure you've all been through it, right? You've all done this. You've all had to play this game with us. So let's look at what people want when they're going to an urgent care. First of all, they actually want us. They want to go to a hospital owned or hospital affiliated urgent care. 70% of people have a slight or strong preference for that. Most people don't want to go to the independent urgent care clinics, the little, uh, the little convenient care clinics that you find in the drug stores, right? But they'll go there if they have to. So they want to come to us. We want them to come to us. We want to take care of them, but we can't seem to figure out how to do that in a way that's convenient, as convenient as buying a can of beans at the grocery store. Now, if you ask for the top 10 reasons that people choose a specific primary care, they say, I want to be able to walk in without an appointment. But they can't do that, because if you want to see me in my primary care clinic, you need an appointment, because the system is built around me, remember? That's what I like about it. They want to be able to get their labs and x-rays done at the clinic, which we offer. We can do that at our urgent care clinics. We can get imaging, and we can get labs done. You want to make sure that we're in network, and we are. We're, in most of the, we're on most of the health plans, all the major health plans. We're a preferred provider for you, especially if you live in our area. So we can actually, it's, it's one, two, three, we got it. This visit will be free, sorry, can't quite go there. But if we're on your plan, it may not be too expensive. It may be not free, but reasonable. We want healthcare to be reasonably priced for our customers. So we, we have this part. We have the part where we're preferred by our customers as a choice of urgent care. So we just don't have the part where we can match things up. And the other thing that would be great when you tech people are making up this technology to solve this problem for me is if you include the ability for me to track metadata. I want to know when are there surges, when are there ebbs, how can I staff appropriately. The most expensive asset I have in my clinics is my human capital. Now, you know healthcare is expensive, but what you may not know is the margins are very, very thin. And if I spend money staffing a clinic that's empty, I don't have a margin. I just blew it all. And if I don't staff a clinic and I have people who are in the waiting room who get tired of waiting and they walk out, then I've also made a bad business decision. So I would like to have something, when you're designing this technology for us, something that allows us to study our population and understand how things flow. How can we make our demand match up with our capacity? Because right now, what we try to do is we try to force the demand into whatever capacity we decide to give them. So we want to do it the other way around. Measure the demand first, build the capacity to meet that. So those are your, that's your objectives. So to put it in a few bullet points, and this is my last slide, how can we make it easy to find a same-day appointment, maybe even get rid of appointments altogether, uh, how can we provide information on the weights for people who want to come to urgent care so you know what you're getting into before you get into it? How can you use your phone or some other technology? You could use your PC, or maybe you could use your smart television now. Um, how can we collect timely uh, data so that we know how to staff in the future? Because there will be some seasonality. There will be some kind of rhythm to this based on times of day, 
I, I bet you anything there's a big surge every day when, when school gets out. That's just a guess on my part. But there might not be. I don't know. I don't have any way of knowing if that's true. Um, and then how can I use this information to better staff my clinics with the right people so I'm not wasting valuable resources when I don't need to? All right? Questions? All right. We're you guys got it all up. figured out already, right? Somebody has this solved. They just, yes. About five minutes for questions. And please wait and let us bring the mics around to you. Are you integrating this with Epic's appointment scheduler? Your I'm glad you frame? asked that because this is an important requirement. We don't want to have our operators having to work in two separate platforms. So we would want something that somehow talks to Epic at the very least that knows what's going to Epic is our electronic health record. Uh, we have a scheduling uh, a part of that that's called cadence that helps us know what the flow is. So even though people come into our urgent cares without an appointment, when they come in, we, we put them in. We put them in as a, as a patient so that we know who's next in line. So you're able to extract data from that being... Well, we can't right now. Okay. But the sometimes knowledge they... base does come from Epic. Yeah, this isn't, that's not enough. I want more. Right. Okay. But what I'm getting at is... But that's where the basic knowledge is coming from all different areas into one central database to be able to pull from, correct? Yeah, yeah. We want to be able to work in one. We want to, as, as, as much as it's possible, we don't want to have to deal with multiple platforms. We want everything one-stop shopping for our operators. And it would be great if an operator at one point could know what was happening to an operator at another position. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. We have another question in the back here. Thanks. I was just wondering if, have you ever asked your uh, patients what do they want? I mean, when I go to my primary care doc, all I care for is they, if they can spend a minute asking me about my frustration and start to compile that sort of a data, but they never care to do so. We've been asking patients what they want for decades, and, and we, we just don't listen to the answer because what they want, <laughs> what they want was in that previous slide that said they want to go to a place that is on their health plan, that's in their network, that they can walk in without having to plan way ahead, that they can get a same day appointment without having to wait forever, and uh, that's free. That's what they want. So. <laughs> We do ask people what they want, and we send out surveys. We survey people like, like nothing you've ever, we do more surveys than any, probably any other industry, and we compile massive amounts of survey responses, and then we don't know what to do with it. A question over here. Okay. Have you considered any telehealth? Telemedicine. So tel telemedicine is something that's already out there. That's not anything new. People can use telemedicine. I used to be a telemedicine physician when I was living in Reno, Nevada. I was the director of telemedicine. And the one thing I did like about telemedicine is I was always on time because the appointment started at 10 o'clock and then at 10.20 it went to another city. And so the patients knew they only had 20 minutes. But this problem we're presenting to you today is not about physician workflow. It's about patient access. So don't confuse the two. Here. So I'm an overly uh -oh, person, it's a plant. It's a plant. I, I won't uh, ask a question, but I'll say very briefly the idea of knowing the wait time at different places. A lot of places do that. Our ER does that, right? Are we doing that in the ED? Not now. Okay. They do so, it at the airport. A lot. Well, a lot of a lot of hospitals will display their current wait time in their ED, for example. What I've never seen, though, is a hospital that says how busy you might expect it to be later this afternoon. So you could look and you could see that it's 20 minutes or an hour right now. The next question you have is, well, what if I wait and go two hours later? Is it likely to be better? Or what about this it, idea? I it like could be like a mapping What if I look and I say, okay, the wait time's an hour, fine, I've got other things to do, put me in line. Then 15 that, that minutes before my hour is up, I get a text message that says, get over here, your hour's about gone, and I've been in line a whole time, but I've been in line while I'm shopping for beans. Okay, it's gonna be one more question over here. So how far out would you want the ability for a patient to schedule at a point where, I mean, I could see this where you could make it for urgent, but you could also say, I wanna schedule something three weeks from now and I know it's booked and I don't even have to interact with somebody at your front desk. We don't want people to schedule. 
we want people to come in when they want to be seen and to be able to be seen when they want to come in. So it's not about, we can do that. We already are really good at scheduling stuff. We're great at scheduling people, and then we're great at rescheduling them when we change our minds. <laughs> so I don't need scheduling. I need access. Don't confuse access and scheduling. Scheduling is the opposite of access. In true access, you walk in when you want to walk in, and you get seen. In scheduling, you tell them when you want to be seen, you show up on time, and then they don't see you. <laughs> Molly, do we have any questions from the interwebs? Okay. Okay. Oh, I don't know how much time I'm allowed. Gonna be the last question. What's your budget? Uh, what? I don't know my budget. What is our budget? Who's got my, Who's got the checkbook? <laughs> Honestly, don't know. They didn't tell us that. The, the budget's really good. What's your proposal? The... <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Free. Yeah. Free. I like free. <laughs> hey, if this works, you don't need to make any money off of us. You can make a fortune selling this to our competitors. All right, so are we, we're good. Okay, so I'm gonna now, I'm gonna hand it back over to Dave who's gonna tell you what problem number two is. And then you can decide if you wanna tackle problem number one or if you wanna tackle problem number two. I don't recommend you try to tackle both problems. I think that would be way too difficult to do both. Right. I agree. All right, so, so uh, you just got the softball. I'm gonna give you the hardball. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So again, what solutions or technologies can help patients navig navigate the Overlake system? Okay. Keyword: navigate. Um, how many people here have been hospitalized? Be brave. Okay. How many felt that that was a really clear process? Let's talk insurance. Let's talk copays. Let's talk moving data around. We have. It was in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm moving. All right. Um, I, I think, you know, I mean, we all know, especially anyone who's been hospitalized or been through a complex process in clinics, this is a very, very confusing, complex system, expensive if you do it wrong, if somebody's not on your plan and you see them. I mean, this is really a big challenge. We, we really look to break this down into three areas for us, three areas that are really crucial when it comes to navigation. So there's sort of the economic domain, uh, which includes things like insurance, payment, and billing questions. Those are simple logistical areas. How do referrals get passed on? I know that sounds really simple, and we'll touch on the EPIC thing here in a second. Testing authorizations, medical records, all of this data, right? There's all this data that resides in different places. Let's throw then the cultural complexities that exist these days. Th there's an amazingly diverse population. I mentioned at the outset the fact that we have over 60 languages that we we're, we're, took care of at Overlake Hospital. Everyone love a spaghetti diagram? Yeah. All right. So th this is simply illustrative, but this is what a patient faces. And you know, the real challenge here is that when you're a patient, you're often at, at the most vulnerable time. Right? You're, you're sick, you're ill, you're needing care, you're having behavioral or mental health challenges. These are times when all of a sudden you're faced with some of the most complex decision making that you have. In fact, it's so complex, there's now actually something called a patient navigator. This is a human being that there's true certification for. You can go to a class and become certified as a patient navigator. In the past, it was often a family member or a friend that did this. The complexity of the system has, has moved beyond that in a lot of cases. And especially as you get into the most complex cases, you know, oncology, cancer, the decisions that need to be made, the, the places you need to go, get it, it's very confusing. It can be very overwhelming. The cultural piece I'm gonna to touch on a little bit more. Um, and Overlake Hospital, this is just one example. So in, in our, um, east side location, one third of our households speak a language other than English at home. Our interpreter services, we had 13,000 in-person uh, translation processes that went on. We had s over 7,000 video or phone translation processes. And our interpreter services handled over 60 languages last year. This is on the east side. Very complicated. Let me spend a second talking about a typical experience. So I'm gonna use a middle-aged male physician, might be me, who was walking down his stairs and tried to not step on his cat. 
He didn't, <laughs> but he also did a header down the stairs. So, um, you know, and, and this person's a pretty sophisticated healthcare user. So this person goes to, um, Oh, I'm sorry, I lost my slide here. But this person, you know, they go to their primary care physician. They say, well, let's try a little conservative therapy. Yeah, your knee hurts, but, you know, I don't think you did any real damage. You do some rest and some ice and some elevation, and you take your anti-inflammatories, and you wait a couple weeks, and you go, I can't walk. You go back to your primary care physician. He said, maybe I'll refer you to the specialist now. So you go to see the specialist. Special we need to do some tests. We need some x-rays, and then we need to do an MRI. You go have those done, another week passes, you go back to your specialist, they say, yep, you, you tore your medial meniscus. Might get better, it might not. You do some more conservative therapy, it doesn't work, you go back to the specialist. You say, okay, we're gonna have to do surgery. You've, you've, it's now been three months. You've got data re all over, uh, residing everywhere. You've got some imaging data, you've got pharmacy data, you've got data at your primary care physician, you've got data at your specialist. How does that all come together? The real key here is that the insurance is at the center of a lot of this. And one of the challenges that we face is that as I move, or the physician or the, the patient move from primary care to specialist, referral required. When the specialist wants to get the MRI done, referral required. Information about the conservative therapy, how much conservative therapy was done, information required at the, at the level of the insurer. So, all of these things feed into to a, a central repository around the insurer. And moving that data in the past involved everything from faxes to phones to literally the patient, and maybe some of you have done this, carried papers, x-rays, whatever information had to go, you carried it from one place to another. So very complex system. So we came up the, with the idea of an electronic concierge, so there was a patient concierge, so what we thought is, could there be systems, could there be something that helps with the movement of this data? And you know, Epic was brought up in the, in the last discussion as well. Some of this data resides in Epic, sure, at the primary care physician, but in my case, or this patient's case, not at the specialist. The labs were done elsewhere, the imaging was done elsewhere. So we have data scattered around. So as we look through our needs, as an institution and to serve our patients, how can this electronic concierge just even establish a base understanding or help guide patients through the billing insurance processes? How can we create a process for expeditious insurance authorizations and approvals? That's about data. So that's about making sure that the required data ends up at the insurer to get it approved. How do we use tools that we're all familiar with, like smartphones? to convey the information back and forth. How does the patient know at what stage the process is? The insurance has approved it, or it hasn't approved it, or it's missing a piece of information. How do, how do we centralize that process? How do we integrate the medical record accessibility? So in our case, how do we get EPIC records out to the various providers? How do we get that data out to the insurer? And then lastly, how do we do all of this in the preferred language of the patient? So, as I said, this, this is the tough one. This is a biggie. This is the future of healthcare, though. This is about interoperability. This is about integration. And, and I think, unfortunately, um, it's going to take some stepwise work to get there. But I think someone who's first at doing this kind of integration or does it really well, even if they're not first, has a tremendous advantage. All right, that's a complex topic. I would think electronic concierge, if you're walking away from here, if we can do all of it, great. If we can do part of it, that may be the answer. So we have five minutes for questions. Again, please wait for the mic to come to you. And for those watching on the live stream, feel free to submit your questions and we can ask them live as well. I saw a couple hands. Hi, so for this challenge and actually the other challenge as well, uh, do you have any access to, you know, because I heard about, you know, um, Epic, stuff like that, do we have any access to do uh, documentation, data sets, APIs for this challenge? Yeah, so, so Epic does make APIs available. Um, it would take work with Epic to, to do that. With, we have an Epic team internally, but it would also take work with the vendor themselves, uh, but they do make APIs available for movement of data. There are obviously other systems out there as well that um, have that availability.
do you get most of this information from mm -hmm. your um, EDI, your communication with your insurance companies currently for the EOBs? Um, you know, it's a mixed bag. I mean, it depends. Our, if, if you're talking internal to, the, to our system, yes. You know, we're, we're an institution that has the vast majority of our providers as independents in the community. So um, we, we still rely on a lot of very manual movement of data um, with those external and independent practices and even, you know, maybe the radiology group um, or if you have lab testing. Um, so it's, again, we're talking a higher level integration here. One way over here. Over here. This way. So is there a particular condition that you would pick as kind of a focal first effort? You mentioned oncology. Would it be joint replacement? Would it be like what, what comes to mind for you guys about if we could solve this mm -hmm. navigator problem right. for this population that would be generalizable? It's a great question. I'm not sure I'm going to answer that with a specific one. I will turn it around, though, and say if you, if you come back, if someone came back with a specific area, that uh, we wouldn't rule it out because it's a specific area. I think we'd be very open to saying, let's start this in this particular field, oncology, orthopedics, something as a, as a beginning to the process. I think that's very reasonable. Are the workflows themselves pretty well defined? Is the problem that the workflows have to be defined, or is the problem they have to be communicated to the patients? You know, it's a it's a great question. You know, overall the workflow flows are reasonably well defined. I mean, there's there's a fair amount of predictability in terms of based on a specific insurer exactly what the process is. So you could literally say, for insurer A. You know, this is the process that's required to get approval for this specific test procedure. Insure B, it, it's actually well defined. Um, so it would take some work as well in that, in that arena to understand for a given procedure what the requirements are with each insurer. But yeah, it's not, it's not a crapshoot by any means. I mean, there's a, there typically is very well defined requirements. Over in the cheap seats. <laughs> I think one of the distinctions here that we're talking about, though, is that we're talking about this from a payer-centric perspective. So the process is fairly clear between the provider of care and the insurance company, but the provider of care may vary across all of these different settings, and the patient is blind to the interactions, which bill gets there first, which gets paid first, which network, which tier, all those different things are invisible to the patient. So. The solution we're looking for is one that helps our patients understand that across a myriad of settings and or potentially payers and providers of care. Very well said. Thank you. That's one of our wonderful Overlake uh, uh, directors. Hi. Yeah. What would be the top three KPIs you will measure to say that this is wow. a success? Wow. Great question. I have to admit, I, I hadn't, uh, hadn't actually thought about that. I mean, I think initially it's going to be very, very... Um, I hate to say this subjective in that it's going to be patient focused. So I think it, they're likely to be focused around the patient and what their perception is of um, the ease of transitions of care, how well the data moved. I think it's, so it's a little squishy at first. I think, you know, after you go through round one, you could probably start looking at things that are a little more objective, but I'm going to have to say initially it's about the patient experience probably. Yeah, I mean, you could look at things like in, in the outpatient environment, CG caps, or in the inpatient environment, age caps, that might be one. But I, I think you'd actually want to develop a separate sort of survey process for this because you're really gauging something a little different. I think you would use those as well, but uh, I think we, we as an institution would want to do something very specific to patients who are part of that to really uh, understand their experience and also, I mean, to improve it, but also to understand whether it's meeting the intended goals. In the scenario you described with the person with the knee issue, yeah. how likely is it that all of the people that they see are going to be within the Overlake community versus are they seeing outside providers? So does this need to be something that integrates all providers or just specific to Overlake? 
Uh, we're looking for all providers. So within the Overlake, what I'll call the Overlake community, and by that I'm, what I'm meaning is our clinic system, we're all on Epic. There's, there is a better flow of data within that. However, we still have issues, we can have issues with radiology, uh, typically not with labs. But we're really looking for a community solution. So it would be how do we get um, orthopedist A to be part of this? How do we get imaging center B to be part of this as well. So it's a complex problem. There's no question about it because they're obviously on different systems. T almost always we're talking about a myriad of systems that they're using. Okay, we have time for one more question. Population health, are you part of an ACO? We are. So wouldn't a lot of this come from the software that they have? to roll up through the community? So there's very little software that addresses ACOs. So in other words, population health, which is a great term, which we all, most of us who are in healthcare understand very, very well what that means. The tools to assist in population health are infancy. Um, they're, they're not robust. Uh, I will tell you that most of the ACO reporting that's done right now, the data comes in in an Excel spreadsheet and it's manually validated, managed, and processed. There's software for that. <laughs> no follow-up? <laughs> there, 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 there is software out there. The, the, key, you know, the, the challenge is integration. What you find is that most, uh, at least in the Northwest, we aren't at a place where typically any of the um, major systems or uh, uh, hospitals have really um, capitalized on what's out there. That's a fairer way to put it. All right, great. And with that, I would like to just thank Dr. Knopfler and Dr. Rochier.